Good evening, everyone. My name is Jenna Weiss, and I'm the Assistant Director of Public Programs at the Jewish Museum. It's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's conversation, Happiness in the Time of Technology, featuring authors Claire Stanford and Gary Steingart, moderated by Stephanie Butnick. Unpacking the book, Jewish Writers and Conversation is co-presented by the Jewish Museum, Jewish Book Council, and Tablet Magazine. Tonight's talk is the final event in the 2022 Unpacking the Book series, but you can watch many of our past programs anytime on Jewish Book Council's YouTube page. Closed captioning is available tonight for those who wish to use it. Simply click on the CC icon at the bottom of your screen to watch the event with captions turned on. Before we begin, I would like to welcome Naomi Firestone Teeter, Executive Director of Jewish Book Council to share a little bit more about tonight's program. Thank you, Jenna. As always, I'm so pleased to be able to welcome you on behalf of Jewish Book Council. We're thrilled to present the Unpacking the Book series for its eighth year in partnership with the Jewish Museum and Tablet Magazine. Each program we've offered in the series brings together authors who approach similar subject matter through their own unique lens. Tonight, we will explore questions around happiness and technology, a fitting topic for a virtual program with authors Gary Steingart and Claire Stanford who each explore the subject in their recently published books, Our Country Friends and Happy For You, respectively. They'll be joined by our always wonderful moderator, Stephanie Butnick. Our mission at Jewish Book Council is to educate, enrich, and strengthen the community through Jewish literature. You can visit our website to learn more about our reviews, essays, and paper brigade, our book club resources and author tours, our literary awards, including the National Jewish Book Awards and Natan Notable Books. I hope you will check out all of our programs, events, and resources, and consider becoming a member to support JBC's continued initiatives. Before we begin tonight's program, I'd like to very quickly thank, of course, the Jewish Museum, and specifically Jenna Weiss, and our media sponsor, Tablet Magazine, the premier publication of Jewish news and ideas in the U.S. A very special thank you as well to Evie Sapphire Bernstein, Jewish Book Council's program director, for managing all the ins and outs of this program. And I'm especially grateful to JVC's Board of Directors for their continued support of Jewish literature, ideas, and conversation. A few housekeeping notes before we begin. If you would like to ask a question of our panelists, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Please also be on the lookout in the chat for links to purchase this evening's books. I hope you'll purchase both of our panelists' books if you have not already done so. And please note that if you need captions, you can add them by clicking on the bottom of your screen, as Jenna noted. And now I'd like to introduce you to Stephanie. Stephanie Butnick is the deputy editor of Tablet Magazine and a host of its weekly podcast, Unorthodox. She is the author, along with her co-hosts, of the newest Jewish encyclopedia, From Abraham to Zabars and Everything in Between. Thank you so much and please enjoy the evening. Thank you, Naomi and Jenna and Evie and the teams of the Jewish Museum and the Jewish Book Council. These events are always a delight, even virtual. And tonight, I assure you, will be um, no exception. I'm joined by two wonderful writers, Claire Stanford, whose debut novel is Happy For You. Um, she holds an MFA in creative writing from the University of Minnesota and is currently a PhD candidate in English at UCLA. Born and raised in Berkeley, she now lives in Los Angeles, where she's joining us in that little box, wherever she is, uh, to my, I don't know where, where she is on your screen. Um, we are also here with Gary Steingart. He is the New York Times bestselling author of the memoir Little Failure and the novel Super Sad True Love Story, Absurdistan, Lake Success, and the Russian Debutante's Handbook, which won the National Jewish Book Award for Fiction. His most recent book, seen here, is Our Country Friends. Gary was born in Leningrad, came to the United States when he was seven, and he joins us tonight virtually from New York City. Welcome, Claire and Gary. Hi. Hey, thanks so much. I'm so happy to be here. Happy to be here. <laughs> <laughs> we are going to have a lot of fun. We're going to talk about happiness in today's fragmented, hyper-technological world, um, which is something that comes up in both of your work. I think we're going to keep things like peppy, um, upbeat, <laughs> not at all dystopic. Um, and I feel like if we if it gets too dark, this like machine I'm wearing on my hand will just like beep and like buzz me back um, to to happiness. It'll tell me to stand up and also um, get more positive. So 
what's going to happen tonight is uh, the three of us are going to chat for a little bit and then everyone who is writing, everyone who has questions, I'm sure you'll have questions, comments, everything like that, pop them into the Q&A box. I feel like everyone knows where that is at that point. It's in the, the menu at the bottom of your screen and at the end of the event, we'll, we'll get to your questions. So um, to get us started, let's, let's have both of you explain, um, tell, us, tell us about these books. Claire, let's, let's start with you. Okay, sure. Um, so my book follows a woman um, named Evelyn Kaminsky Kumamoto. She is half Japanese American, half Jewish, um, and she is 31 years old and she is um, leaving a PhD program in philosophy to work at a tech company, the third most popular internet company, um, which is developing an app to try to, to measure user happiness, to objectively measure user happiness. And the app is um, going to be called Joyful with two L's um, and merges about a third of the way through the book. Um, and her job at this company is to participate in um, creating the app, kind of contribute questions toward thinking about what the app should be asking, what the app should be thinking about as it's measuring happiness. And then the book is following her as she is engaged in this project and it's exacerbating a lot of questions in her own life and a lot of things she's grappling with about um, what kind of work she wants to do, what kind of um, person she wants to be, um, if she wants to get married, if she wants to be a mother, um, her own relationships with her uh, father and um, her late mother and just kind of figuring out all of these questions that are in her life and kind of just the general um, confusion of being a person in the world and how that is interacting then with this app that's going to give you a 7.1 or an 8, 8.0 or you know whatever based on some biometrics and some questions it's asking about your happiness level. Gary, how about you? Uh, well, I wrote Our Country Friends uh, during the pandemic. Um, everyone was making bread, but I, I don't know how to make bread. So I, I wrote this instead. Uh, and it is uh, it is set during the pandemic. I was, uh, I split my time between the city uh, and upstate New York or upstate New York. Uh, and I uh, was upstate for that time and I was very lonely. There was no one to drink with or go out with. So I, uh, I started imagining what it'd be like if uh, seven of my friends moved in with into my house with me upstate uh, and all the dialogue that would happen, uh, people falling in love, old friends getting angry at each other. Uh, uh, and there is a small technological component, uh, obviously not as big as in, as in Claire's book, but there's a there's an app called True Emotions. And one of the uh, one of the friends uh, is the owner of this tech company. She's worth billions. And what happens in this is two people take a photo of themselves, a, a selfie, I guess, and the, the algorithm makes them fall in love with one another. So it's like uh, sort of, uh, I was thinking like a mid, Midsummer's Night Dream, you know, puck, but in a more kind of digital update. Uh, and that happens to two people with very disastrous consequences uh, in the book. So, uh, and then, you know, like I said, people fall in love, they have relations, uh, and uh, then uh, terrible things uh, uh, ensue. Gary, there's a line in your book that feels very relevant for tonight. Um, it's about Karen, the True Emotions app developer. And you didn't say that it's like T-R-O-O -O with umlauts. I love umlauts and I try to have them in every book. You know, it's the only way to sell to the Swedish market. You need those umlauts. <laughs> So you write, recently she had sworn to stop uploading photographs to the very social media that had made her rich, to enjoy moments instead of imprisoning them. Um, mm -hmm. This rang very true to me, all except for the part about like making a ton of money on a social media app. But like, let's let's dive into that, to the idea of enjoying moments instead of imprisoning them. I don't know. I, I, I feel I feel like you know, in the lead up to this event, I posted on Instagram that we were all doing this event together and I tagged you. It's like you tag it and you like it and you and you share it. Um, but how do we sort of stop imprisoning ourselves? How do we sort of make sure we're not imprisoning ourselves? It's tough. I mean, I, I'm only speaking for myself, of course, but uh, I love to travel. Eating and traveling are my two favorite things. And I was just on a eating tour of Mexico City, one of my favorite cities. And I realized that I was running around with my phone and I was, you know, I would take a picture of something and then, okay, done. I don't have to experience it anymore. And I would move on to the next thing. Whereas before that, I remember when you had film that you had to crank in there, uh, you really had to take your time. You didn't want to just take a photo of anything because, you know, it would, some of you younger folks may not remember this time, but, you know, it would, you know, it would take you, a, you would have to pay for to have it developed. So you wouldn't take a photo of just anything, you know. 
Um, but uh, now it's just, okay, did this, did that, did this, this, did that, you know, and there's, there's a, a checklist even in your computer telling you what you need to see, what you need to eat. And there's a lack of spontaneity. And that's what I feel like when I'm talking about imprisoning a moment instead of enjoying it, instead of interacting with it, um, sort of creating a screen around it and then moving away to the next thing. Um, this to me feels like a lot of the way people live, uh, fear of missing out, all of that is just basically a, a source of saying, I did it, you know, I went, I went there and now I have proof and the proof ultimately is gonna be on Instagram uh, that I went there and the proof of me being there is more important than me actually being there. Me being there is secondary to what I'm telling the world about me being there, if that makes any sense. You know, and Evelyn, I'm sorry, Claire, Evelyn in your book, you know, she has a few moments where she's like trying to take a picture of something and realizes that it's so beautiful she mm -hmm. can't actually capture it on film. Like, can you talk to us a little bit about that distance? Yeah. I mean, there are a lot of these moments. I mean, I was really interested in my book and having these moments where people are trying to take photos of various things. There's also a scene where a man on the bus is taking a photo of the security footage, like video on the bus and Evelyn is watching this and is like, what is happening? Why, why would we take a photo of that? Um, so I'm, I'm I'm really interested in this idea of like, what is it that we choose to capture? I love the idea of, you know, I don't love the idea, but I love the phrasing of imprisoning um, the moment. Um, and I think something that in the book I'm grappling with and Avalon, the character is grappling with is um, both the kind of technology and the way that that is creating so much mediation um, and then just larger questions of um, how mediation gets in the way of happiness and really fully being in the moment. I mean, since we are talking about technology, I think in particular kind of building what Gary is saying, um, not just um, needing the proof, but but this kind of comp compulsion to package our lives in a way that can go on social media and also that can get likes on social media, um, that certain kinds of things just tend to get more likes, right? So that's something my book is grappling with too around um, if, if marriage and motherhood and buying a house are the things that, you know, the, the, the tribe has kind of decided are gonna get the most likes on social media, what kind of pressures does that start um, putting on people about what kind of lives they can see for themselves, um, whether they're conscious or subconscious pressure. So I'm not saying that I think anyone's like consciously, you know, adapting their life for likes, although that is what influencers do, I think, but not kind of the, the normal person. Um, but then, you know, more generally in the book, kind of asking these questions about what are the ways that we kind of mediate happiness? Evelyn is someone who really gets in her own head, which um, you know is something I relate to. Uh, and so kind of questions of how, how can we be in the moment um, more, whether that's kind of divorcing ourselves from technology or finding other ways to be more kind of centered in the body, um, finding ways to experience the natural world. Um, what is it that we need to do to be kind of more in the moment and in the flow of life? It's it's really interesting because, you know, Gary, you mentioned you, like if you're on vacation and you're sharing these or you're on a, you know, this food tour, tour that you're doing, you know, people from all over the world can see you doing that. So there is, is there like the plus side of people get to see, oh, look at this cool place or look at this place I may never get to because it's really far away. Like, is there, are there positives here yeah, too? There are positives. I mean, I, you know, I'm Mr. Doom and Gloom and everything, but uh, there are positives in that, you know, for example, a friend I hadn't seen for 10 years, last time I saw him, it was in Madrid. And he, uh, you know, he, 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 on Instagram, he said, oh, I actually live in Mexico now. And so we got together for a couple of, uh, you know, dinners and stuff. So yeah, absolutely. Uh, there are positives. There's this endless kind of connectivity that I think is okay. Um, it's weird. I know that, you know, on Twitter, when I write something, potentially half a million people will read it um, more if it gets retweeted. But I actually, I do miss the small things. I, I, you know, uh, Claire was talking about nature and our country friends happened, the novel happened because I was stuck upstate. I did have my internet, et cetera, but you can't do that 20 hours a day. So I began to walk around and, and I began to identify trees. Actually, there's apps for this, you know, <laughs> for our city dwellers where it's like, oh, this is a groundhog and that's an aspen or whatever, you know. Uh, you can point your camera and your, your phone in, and it'll give you what, what that animal or, or tree is. Uh, but all of that was interesting. You know, I was talking, I was having a, uh, I was being interviewed by a friend of mine and he said, yeah, he said, this book, there's a lot more sounds than usually happen in your books. In your book, there's a lot of, you know, sights and, and smells. I'm very olfactory. 
but in this book, there's a lot of oral stuff happening. Um, and I didn't even notice that, but I think that's what being in nature for however long, about eight months before we came back to the city uh, did. And it really was a healthy antidote. And I'm not saying, I mean, I was glad that I could talk to my friends in Los Angeles or Berlin during this time, you know, or wherever in the world. But at the same time, it felt like, um, you know, um, that it was quite a boon to not have constant imprisoning of moments, you know, and I posted less, I did less stuff like that. Um, it was wonderful. You, know. you wrote a book? I wrote a book, right? <laughs> as fast as I've ever written a book before, because, you know, very limited uh, internet and, and no one to drink with. Yeah. Yeah, I thought that was also, um, as I was reading your book here, that it really stood out to me, these nature scenes and the way that kind of the walks and the deer and the, um, the constant falling trees that are plaguing <laughs> um, one of them, the main character and kind of landlord and like thinking of Kind of the way that the natural world is is reminding us how little power we actually have and how much we have to just be kind of um surrendering to it in a lot of the ASEAN. I love that idea. Yeah, because I think you're right. I think there's a kind of lack of control sometimes to technology, you know, that that we don't fully understand. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it's a new ecosystem and uh some people are really good at it and others are not. <laughs> myself included yeah although i've really enjoyed your instagrams from mexico oh. so. <laughs> as someone who also loves traveling and food I'll follow you back immediately yeah. yes please follow her right now um, as part of this you know and claire and in your book there is there's like this animal program that keeps like there's there's yeah. animals that are almost like this antidote to evelyn's like technological mm. focused life i mean did you see that as sort of a an an alternate like an alternate way of life almost yeah exactly that's like that's exactly how I was thinking of it so Evelyn becomes um, very enthralled by this TV show that's called Misfits exclamation point um, it's a nature show and it's profiling animals that are not like lions or peacocks it's profiling like the big headed mole rat and um, the cockapoo which doesn't know how to defend itself it just flies very still because it's never had any predators um, and I think she is really interested in this show as a way of seeing how other beings can coexist and can kind of make their way in the world. And especially as um, she's immersed more and more and more in this tech world that she feels is trying to really standardize the human experience. I mean, it's trying to standardize emotions and happiness, but then also everything that's gonna um, kind of stream from that. Then she's seeing these animals who you know, some of them, the, the men um, give birth to the, the babies, like the seahorse. Some of them have these like very obscure and, you know, um, unusual mating rituals where like the minute leaf chameleon just grabs onto the female and it'll never ever let go because it's so hard to find another chameleon um, in the wild. And so she's just seeing, you know, this huge range of the way that people, I don't know, people, beings can experience the world. And I think it's giving her some kind of comfort and um, like, sucker and um yeah i was seeing it as kind of like a foil for the way that things are being coming more and more um standardized at least online and through technology and that the the world is still full of so much surprise and life and you know strangeness and change um so that's becoming apparent to her through the show you know it's funny oh sorry gary i was just gonna add that i think the people have Throughout this last two years, people have fallen in love with animals more than ever. Mm -hmm. I think there's an unpredictability to humans, and especially now that we're this kind of hybrid being, part online, part in real life. Uh, but animals are always, animals are not online yet. Uh, <laughs> so, as far as we know. <laughs> as far as we know. And so I think people have really gotten closer to their, I mean, I follow a dachshund channel. That's my favorite channel on, on Instagram, just different dachshunds playing with each other. I love the... Capybara, the world's biggest rodent. I'm sure you, you know of it in your animal. Mm -hmm. uh, I went to Brazil to visit it. It's just there's these furry creatures are keeping us sane, you know, as we drive each other crazy and as the technology drives us crazy. So I'm glad that you have that in your book. <laughs> so animals are the answer. They're the antidote. You know, it's funny. There, there's new technologies in both of your book, fictional new technologies. But Gary, you wrote a book, you wrote Super Sad True Love Story in 2010 that basically presaged like a new era of like wearable technology. What is that like to create something and then actually see oh, <laughs> engineers God. make it? It all happened. I mean, uh, there's tiny details in that book that have weirdly enough taken place that I keep reading in newspapers like uh, 
I had a tiny detail in London, Goldsmith College, the main art school was taken over by HSBC, the bank. And in the Guardian, they just had a feature, you know, just like in Super Sad, the book, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the college was bought by a bank and everyone was fired. Uh, and then onion skin jeans today, which is a kind of semi-translucent jeans today on Twitter, I saw that they'd come out with this, this thought thing that I thought never, nobody would ever wear. You're literally naked, you know, you're just wearing it. They're see-through. Uh, so almost all of it took, uh, has happened, and I, I really didn't think that any of this would happen for decades, but I wrote that book, that book was published in 2010, so it took 12 years for almost all of it to, to take place, which I think means that technology is moving at such a fast pace that it's almost impossible to think of the present moment. It's almost every book we write is a book about the future. You know, that's why you're seeing, I think, so many books like yours that are about technology, because it's very hard to divorce technology from any human experience that we have today, including, of course, the mating rituals, you know. Um, I'm actually researching for a book and for an article some of this new stuff, including VR headsets that will, mm -hmm. allow us to, you know, you probably, Claire, you've, you've, you've heard of it. Um, I'm, you know, being as old as I am, I'm, I think somebody once said it, uh, that my generation is like the last people off the, uh, the roof in Saigon, you know, the helicopters taking off, the last mm -hmm. choppers out of Saigon before it fell, uh, for those of us who, you know, who are still mating before any of this technology and actually had to meet someone at a party or be set up or whatever, you know, it, it was a whole uh, uh, different world. But I'm still incredibly, because I'm someone who's very invested in what the future will look like, um, I'm definitely going to be writing and thinking about all of this stuff because in some ways it's, in some ways it's the only game in town. Obviously stuff like the pandemic and the war in Ukraine remind us that there can be global events that don't necessarily are entirely controlled by social media, although they do contribute to them a lot, uh, but you're reminded that um, so much of what we do now, you know, from Amazon deliveries to, to romantic uh, encounters happens uh, via the small screen of our phones. You know. you know, Gary, I wanted to ask you, this is a pandemic novel. That's sort of what everyone was calling it when it, when it came out and, and still, what is it like to like, be, it's 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 a moment that passed right it's that that mm -hmm. some that that 2020 those early days um with the mask and we didn't know anything um what is it like to sort of be promoting a book about a time that is past but now and the, you know i know you haven't been asked that i'm sure in your, well, in your book tour. Mean, you know it's funny my british publisher said we're not going to buy this because uh nobody wants to read about this damn thing we're all going through it uh, another publisher in the UK bought it and it, you know people actually do want to read it and weirdly enough you know <laughs> because it said in the first months of the pandemic some people have told me that they said you know oh I kind of miss those early days you know I hate pandemic 4.0 or whatever we're in right now but the first one was great and I'm like yeah but people were dying and continue to die but I think uh, but I think people kind of it's an important touchstone in people's lives I think no one's going to forget this First of all, I don't know when we're gonna get rid of this given the way our societies are structured and the way uh, we haven't been able to come together as societies to really get rid of it fully. And a lot of that does have to do with social media and other ways of, uh, of misinformation get spread. But I think people do have a strange, I mean, those were weird months, but I think, for example, going back to the theme of, of, of love, you know, a lot of my friends who have been single for years, decades, uh, found a partner during the pandemic. It was like people were just like that poor polar bear in the New York Central Park Zoo who kept walking back and forth and eventually went nuts because he was so lonely. Uh, everyone uh, decided that they needed a, you know, a polar bear mate and, um, and started to do so. So for me, this is a, a huge interpersonal, both a tragedy, of course. I mean, we've lost a million people in the States alone. God knows what the true number is around the world, uh, but also an incredible... A uh, milestone for for our civilization, I think. So, how how do you not write about it eventually in some way? I also feel like we learned so much about community at that time, um, and I'm I'm curious how that's played out in your own lives. I mean, so much so much of what happened was virtual. I mean, we're still here. We're here virtually. We're not in person together. But at the same time, people we were writing in to say saying where they were from. I mean, there are people from around the world here that couldn't necessarily be with us if this was you know at the jewish museum which it, it typically is i'm curious how that sense of community has changed for the two of you during this period of time claire 
Um, I mean, I think it's so, I mean, it's so nice to be able to do these kind of virtual events and, um, you know, the beginning, it's good to see everyone in the chat. I think also, as we were talking about earlier, I mean, there are real benefits to all of this technology, you know, I've, as I've been delving more into being on Twitter and Instagram and uh, kind of being on book tour, like I have been trying to frame it as um, a method of kind of authentic communication and really being able to um, make kind of more one-on-one, -on -one, like Gary was saying with his friend in Mexico City, kind of um, contacts instead of, you know, framing it as like forming a Claire Stanford brand or something, you know, which I don't even know what that would um, look like. Um, I mean, I do think community, how has community changed? Like we said before this panel that we weren't going to be dark. I don't want to be dark, but I, <laughs> I do feel like, you know, um, I mean, I think Gary's book is really um, genius at showing both um, the way communities come together, but also the way that people really were in a lot of ways kind of on their own in, in, in a lot of senses. And it was kind of like um, luck of the draw of where you started out at the beginning of this experience to some degree, right? Like the book is interrogating privilege in a lot of ways and the way that privilege kind of pulls these people through. Um, so I think, you know, that we, there have been pluses and minuses in the ways community has changed over the last couple of years in terms of, um, what has been revealed about um, people, both for a positive and negative. I mean, some people have been revealed to be much more generous and much stronger people than you ever would have expected. And also the total flip side of that. Um, but it has been really nice for me to be kind of back, you know, back in bookstores, getting to, getting to be out a little bit at least. And then also the addition of these kind of really wonderful events that bring people together all around the world. Is this your first book tour, Claire? This is my first book tour, yeah. Isn't it great? Isn't it yeah, wonderful? and it's been nice to be able to do a mix of events it has been really wonderful. Yeah, I mean, I from the from, that was my favorite thing when, I, when my first book came out was, was the surprise of meeting somebody who's, who's gonna read your book or has read your book is just, uh, it's a, you know, it's astonishing and wonderful, and uh, yeah, of course, I'm I'm happy to be on Zoom. But there's something incredibly pleasurable about um, meeting a for you know someone in the flesh. Obviously, now they have the mask and all that, but you know it's 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 wonderful. And and it's interesting because we now read books in two ways or three ways, really: audio uh, on your computer, or, uh, whatever it's called. I don't even use the iPad or mm -hmm. Amazon Kindle. Kindle, that's what I'm looking for or the real thing, you know, and I think there's a kind of some analogy to that. You can enjoy it on every level, but to me always the, the real thing, the tactile thing is, is always the most pleasurable. Um, and that's something I do miss, uh, I th or, you know, I, I remember when I was uh, a kid, when I was a teenager and you'd get on the subway in New York and people would be reading books, real live books all the time. And you could sort of, you know, check someone out, see if, you know, if they're reading Glenn Beck, they're you're probably not gonna wanna talk to them or something like that. There's definitely kind of, you know, stuff happening. Um, you could see someone, you walk into someone's house and you see their bookshelf. It's a real portrait of their, of their soul, if you will, if I may use that word in a way that uh, probably doesn't exist. Uh, you know, you can't just pick up someone's Kindle and I guess you could, but <laughs> it's creepy if you did that. So uh, yeah, so book tours, that sort of tactile experience is really great. And that, you know, but obviously I know that a lot of communities, I mean, I have friends in, the part of the world that's now inflamed uh, because of the war. And obviously, do I prefer to keep up with them in a cheap way, you know, that you couldn't do before unless you were dialing 15 numbers on your rotary phone, trying to get a, an operator to connect you? Of course, this is much better. Uh, so yes, there's obviously huge, huge advantages too. You know, it's funny, Gary, I first listened to your book on Audible and I love the narrator. The narrator was great. Did all these different like voices of characters. But it wasn't until I started preparing for this, I got my actual print copy, that I had no idea that true emotions is spelled the way it's spelled, the <laughs> O's. And I had no idea that the character of the actor is capitalized. The A yeah. in actor is capitalized. And I thought, I, I, I wonder if I'm missing, you know, there, what are the other things we miss? Because you, this was intended to be read in print in, in such a funny way. Yeah, no, it's true. I mean, the, the, the gentleman that read it is great, Rob Shapiro. He's a, he's a surgeon. <laughs> yeah, he's a surgeon. And then for fun, he does audiobooks, but he's very well respected in the industry. So, um, yeah, but you know, I mean, so many people tell me that they've heard the audiobook instead of read it because they live, let's say, in Los Angeles, where you know, they spend four hours on the 405 or whatever that thing is. Uh, so they don't have time. <laughs> they're, they're commuting most of the day. So, 
Um, I, I, I prefer any delivery system possible, but I think, uh, you know, I'm sure by the end of my life, it'll be like, you, you take a capsule in, you swallow a capsule and it'll just flow through your brain. And, you know, if you want to stop it, you press on your ear or something and it'll pause it or I, I'm Don't sure say it. It's going to happen if you write it down. No, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but wouldn't that be cool too? Like <laughs> our country friend is the pill, you know, and you just take it. Uh, and like, what would it, you design it? Like I could see it being like kind of like blue and green. Yeah. Like, yeah. That would be the book cover. It'd, it'd be exactly like the book cover. You could buy a, if you want large print in your brain, you'd buy a big pill. If you want the regular, I, I don't know. I'm just spitballing here as they say in, uh, in TV rooms, but yeah. <laughs> Claire, I feel like that's something that the company Evelyn works for would be making next. Uh, yeah, they're probably already making it and they're they're just trying to get whatever the next thing is. I mean, I it was interesting. Um, it was so interesting to hear Gary talking about Super Sad True Love Story. That book is a huge foundational book for me. Um, and I was thinking about it a lot while writing this too. Um, and, you know, wanting to be um, making sure I'm not treading on any of the same ground as Super Sad True Love Story. Um, and when I was writing Happy For You, I mean, it started out as a more, I think it still is a speculative concept, thankfully, that we don't have someone exactly um, measuring our happiness in the way this company thinks it is going to be or is testing out. Um, but it has crept a lot closer to reality in the time while I was writing the book and while we, you know, had, after we'd sold the book, waiting for the book to come out, that now there are all these apps that are kind of purporting to help you kind of improve your happiness in all these ways. Um, and they don't combine in quite the same way as um, Joyful does. And they're not quite as like pushy in their artificial intelligence as Joyful is. Um, it gets quite um, noji and a lot of it's questioning of Evelyn unless the time goes on. But um, yeah, it's just really interesting to think about how, yeah, just how fast tech is moving now um, and, and what, tech is not, what tech is willing to just like let us lose, right? I mean, it would be like, on one hand, I know we're joking about like fantastic to be able to take a pill and now I've read like all of Proust, but on the other hand, like, you know, part of it is that I meant to experience that. I meant to experience the difficulties of it and the beauties of it. And I meant to experience that, you know, on the subway and in like a beautiful park and, and all of that is kind of something that, you know, at least my book is, is grappling with in the way that tech is trying to optimize everything. But what things do we not want to be optimized, maybe? Um, I think there's lots of things in life that we would rather not have optimized, or at least that I would rather not have optimized. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting because there's been, what, 12 years between the publication of Super mm -hmm. Fan and, and of your book. And, you know, back then when that book came out, it was like, oh my God, this stuff will never happen. It all felt like science fiction and people mm -hmm. were looking at science fiction. But nowadays, after tech, after endless technological churn, after you know political dysfunction, after geopolitical dysfunction, like any book you write is not science fiction because mm -hmm. almost at this point our innocence is gone and almost anything is believable. You know, if if tomorrow you know there was a sentient capybara that giant rodent in Brazil I love that yeah. ran you know uh, ran for president in a third party ticket, I'd be like, all right, you know, that's I guess that's what's happening yeah. now, you know. Um, and in some ways, there's a beauty to that. The fact, you know, I have a little kid and I, I, although I worry for his future, I also know that as a smart kid, he can hopefully discover new ways of, of circumventing the, some of the awful stuff that we've built into our society. But on the other hand, it's also um, this feeling of um, when I don't know what's gonna happen, when I don't know the basics of what's gonna happen for people like myself who like some form of control. And I think we discussed control before and, and how it relates to technology, you know, it takes some of that away because I don't know what's, you know, I don't know how, how I'm going to vote for that sentient capybara. Mm -hmm. or what's going to happen next? Yeah. I mean, I've talked with other writers too about how it's almost harder in some ways to write realist fiction right now because reality is changing so rapidly and in such massive ways all the time. Basically, I mean, at least since the beginning of the pandemic, right, that changed a lot of things we didn't know what reality was going to look like um, coming out of the pandemic if we ever came out of the pandemic and in some ways it's easier than to start writing science fiction or a speculative fiction world because at least you get to make up some of the rules and it can stay kind of stable as the world that you have created as opposed to this constantly shifting reality. Yeah and, and when I was younger I wrote more satirical or more well, dystopian science fiction whatever you want to call it books because uh, the present was kind of stable and I wanted to project, but some of it was unstable and I wanted to project which parts of the iceberg were going to float off first, you know, mm -hmm. 
but now that we're all in a nice flow, I kind of want to focus on the smaller life, maybe some of the personal or private lives within each individual ice flow, which is why when I was writing this book, of course, that was a, the perfect setting for it because I was living all alone in a, in a country house um, and populating with imaginary characters. But yeah, that's that kind of should I should, you know, should one go long wide angle lens or small angle or uh, that that's the kind of question that I think a lot of writers are going to be grappling with as our world continues to move in deeply unpredictable ways. Mm -hmm. So let's get to the Jewish stuff. Um, it's been 37 minutes. I'd like to talk about, so I'd like to talk about Jews. Um, so Claire, your main character, Evelyn Kaminsky Kumamoto is half Jewish, half Japanese. She, that comes up all the time. She brings it up. Everyone brings it up to her, this idea of like halfness. Mm -hmm. Um, why, why was that sort of something you wanted to explore and, and how did you sort of go about doing that? I mean, for one thing I wanted to explore it because, um, it's just a, character who I haven't seen that much um, in fiction and um, especially kind of coming from Asian American um, side of fiction to see an Asian American Jewish uh, protagonist is meaningful to me um, personally and putting that out in the world. Um, but I think it's also really uh, important to the whole structure of the novel that Evelyn is someone who um, really for her whole life has felt in some ways outside of kind of simplified categorization and has had it pointed out to her many, many times through kind of these microaggressions um, that she is outside of categorization and had just like people's constant curiosity about her as a, um, as a person who, you know, doesn't fit in, who might consider themselves a misfit, another reason for her being so attracted to this uh, TV show. And then she goes into this world where they're trying to hyper categorize everybody. Um, so especially through some of the questions, I mean, some of the questions that App asks are questions that I myself have struggled with, you know, about like, um, what race do you say that you are when you're biracial and you have a drop down menu and you can only pick one race? This is starting to kind of um, be improved in a lot of um, algorithms and a lot of these kind of drop down menus where you can now say two or more, but it used to be that you could only say one or the other or other and you had to like click the word other to describe yourself, <laughs> which is just a really um, horrible experience and very bad uh, user, you know, UX to use a text ter tech term. So yeah, I mean, to her, um, I think she is, she's looking for a way to kind of grapple with that and find where she fits in. And as someone who hasn't fit in, um, needs to figure that out. And then I think the Jewish, um, part of the book is also, there's a chapter where she's remembering her bat mitzvah and her experience with her mother there and both of her parents. And I think it really relates to a question of this kind of overall question of yearning and yearning for meaning right now that, um, you know, people are perennially experiencing, but how do we put um, religion and the kind of meaning and questions that religion can answer and explore side by side with um, these kind of more sim simplistic kind of internet technologies that are doing, you know, in my opinion, kind of the exact opposite in a lot of ways. It's interesting, Gary, I feel like there's a lot of that with your characters as well, right? These sort of different people who represent different thing. You know, we have our, our Soviet emigres, of course, <laughs> or our Jewish protagonists, and then we have sort of other people who are various like outsiders in different ways even in this it, even in this community that they've built at, yeah. at the house yeah it's interesting i mean the the, the book cites a study that, that it, it pretends is fictional but it's a real study about friendships that were formed in during my generation and a little later uh between soviet jews uh korean immigrants indian immigrants specifying i think gujarati and tamil especially those areas and later West African uh, immigrants, Nigeria, et cetera. And those are the people I grew up with. I went to a Stuyvesant, the math and science school in, um, in Manhattan, and that's who we were. They were. There were some native born people, but mostly it was these immigrant groups. And my friendships developed along those lines completely. Uh, so all, most of my best friends are from those, uh, those groups. And I'm very careful, like, you know, I can't write, say, a a Taiwanese American character because I, I know some Taiwanese Americans, but I don't have, you know, they're not good friends of mine. But I write about Koreans because my wife is Korean, my son is half Korean, half Soviet Jew, obviously. Uh, my mentor Chang Rae Lee was Korean. A lot of my best friends were Indian. So those are the, 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 you know, the the cultures that I know, pretty much almost, you know, to the extent that I know my own, uh, and I feel very comfortable with them, and hopefully they feel very comfortable with me. And I just wanted to highlight that kind of world because I think that's the world that 
a lot of people from my generation of immigrants to New York, to big metropolitan areas experienced. Um, and in fact, the, the uh, character I'm writing now is the next generation, uh, a woman in her 20s, uh, who is also half Korean, half uh, Russian Jewish like myself. Um, because, you know, <laughs> write what you know, as they say. And uh, when I look down and see my kid, that's obviously uh, what's happening. Uh, and it's interesting because I think there's going to be a lot of that, uh, obviously, Claire, you're writing about it, uh, but there's going to be, to use that academic term, tons of hybridity coming down the pike. Um, I think most of the relationships I know uh, are in some ways hybrid um, in many different ways. Um, so I think that this is a way, uh, and, and I teach a creative writing at Columbia, um, and so many of the students that I'm seeing now are also uh, from different backgrounds. You know, they contain multitudes, sometimes three or four different backgrounds given how their grandparents are situated. So, um, and, but it's interesting to combine that with the Jewish element again, because Jewish element I think has always been about migration, taking in different cultures. Um, you know, I, even walking through Mexico city, you know, there's a, there's a Korean section there's like an Armenian outpost, and then there's you know the section where so many many of the Jews live, and so a lot of the people that I know are part of these very migratory cultures. And although of course we all have different stuff, there's also many similarities. You know, when I write about the Korean immigrant mom, there's there's some stuff that reminds me of the the Soviet immigrant mom, and the, you know, and both cultures love cabbage, for example. Uh, you know, the Koreans do it much better than than the Russians do, but. Um, yeah, cabbage and, and academia are two, two big overlaps. So. That's our Venn diagram. Um, this actually brings us to a great um, audience question who is asking Claire, who says, um, in Happy For You, characters are often referred to with a summary description such as an Asian man, a white woman. I wonder if Ms. Sam Sanford wanted the reader to examine how quickly we categorize people and put them into our own prejudice stereotypical boxes and how social media pushes us to those split seconds split second perceptions or lack of perceptions? Can I just say yes? No, <laughs> but that was a great, that question has such a good reading of what's happening um, embedded in it. Um, I mean, I think, yes. Yeah, so Evelyn is someone who's very quick to categorize. I think this is a little bit of a defensive mechanism from her that she knows that other people are attempting to categorize her, that in her experience that's been going on. Um, she is also quick to categorize and is starting to realize as the course in the novel um, takes place that um, some of her categorizations and some of her assumptions are in fact wrong as well as she doesn't have kind of like the, you know, full understanding either. It's not like she is so much better than the tech company. I mean, she, she is thinking about things more complexly than the tech company, but she's complicit in some of these ideas. Um, it's also part of, I think, a kind of increasing movement and in literature of um, you know, just not assuming default whiteness in characters. So um, not, I'm, I'm trying to find a way in, in my book, you know, subtly or not subtly, but or through the vision of the character to be able to um, give a nod to everyone if I'm gonna nod, if I'm gonna recognize what certain people's um, racial backgrounds are and that I just don't want there to be kind of an assumption in my um, world of default whiteness for characters. So that's another reason that um, characters are sometimes tagged as, white or, um, you know, uh, blue eyed or, you know, something that will give that away or they're tagged with um, kind of nationality. But yeah, it is more so that's kind of a secondary craft element. It's more so a question of how are we categorizing people and how quick are we to categorize people? What is the need for that? Is that kind of like an innate human kind of tribal need or not too is another question I think the book is asking about it. And, and Jewishness functions in a really interesting way here, right? Because, you know, as someone else points out, Jewish isn't on many of those drop down menus, yeah. but in many ways, it is such a key point of identity that yeah. it feels weird to not not point out. Gary, I mean, in your experience, that was something, you, you know, Soviet Jews were marked as as being Jewish. I mean, how does that how do you see that being different in America? Yeah, I mean, it was very funny. In, this, in the Soviet Union, obviously, Jews were marked uh, a line in the passport. I think it was line number six was nationality. And that included Ukrainian, Belarusian, Russian, and Jewish was its own separate category. So there we were seeing, it was definitely not marked as a race, but as a, as a religion, rather, I'm sorry, but rather as a race or a people. Then when I came to America, I went to a, a Jewish day school 
And there I was considered the other because I was Soviet. I had a big fur hat, you know, the whole, all, the, all those things. So there I was very much other, almost like I wasn't Jewish there. I was this separate, different category as well. Um, and, um, and so it was really until I, I ended up at a place like Stuyvesant where everybody was from somewhere else that I felt the most at home. Um, but I think that the Jewish identity, yeah, it is very separate, but I don't know. I mean, let's look at other sort of groups, you know, I mean, it, it, should there be a category for Middle Eastern, right? Um, should there be a category for Balkan, right? Armenian, we, I mentioned Armenia before, you know, there's people in the Caucasus region, for example, where do you put them, right? They're technically in Asia. They, in Russia, they're considered there's all these, you know, racist insults hurled toward them, although theoretically they're Caucasian, right? So, I, I mean, these are very interesting distinctions. And I wonder if, because we are, our identities are getting so um, thoroughly examined, if there will be a future where one could sort of look even further, where that drop down menu is going to go on for, for a very long time. And <laughs> I don't know. I guess I have the patience. It's like when you have to scroll through, you know, country on, on those things. And sometimes the United States comes up first, but sometimes it doesn't. And you're like going on for an hour, making yourself an espresso, you know, like, okay, almost, <laughs> almost to Venezuela. So, um, but yeah, these are, look, and these are all interesting questions. And I think fiction, literature, nonfiction, I think we're all exploring the heck out of it right now. I think that's sort of the, the topic that we're very interested in. And I think, you know, again, America, because for better, mostly for better, yeah, is, is one of the best multicultural examples of a country. And so we're always gonna be at the forefront of examining that and then it'll trickle over to, you know, Belgium or whatever. You know, I'm, I'm curious to ask you, Gary, about, you know, with everything going on in Ukraine with Russia, I mean, how do people perceive you? I mean, there's such an interesting thing, right? There are so many people here from that region who have very complicated relationships yeah. with all of it. Yeah. I mean, I'm, you know, both, both of my father's parents, uh, my grandma and grandpa were born in Ukraine. Um, so, but my mother's mother was born in Belarus and her father was born in Russia, right? So I represent all three of those republics with the majority thankfully from Ukraine. But he was, my, my grandfather moved from Ukraine to Leningrad and he died in World War II fighting the, the, fighting the fascists, you know, uh, during the defense of Leningrad. He is a Ukrainian first, Ukrainian Jew was fighting the fascists in Leningrad and perished when my father was only three years old. Obviously that had a huge impact on my father and on me as well. Um, but then 10 years after he died in Leningrad, the city he was defending, uh, there was born a future fascist, Vladimir Putin, uh, born actually just a few metro stops from where I grew up in Leningrad. And you know now he's using the memory of all these dead soldiers from places like Ukraine to invade Ukraine, a country that has, in the ultimate sort of circular logic of this, a Jewish president, you know, <laughs> who is now beloved by 93% of Ukrainians. So I mean, history is just endlessly fascinating, and in this case, obviously very tragic. Um, but of course, I am disgusted by what's going on. It's, it's hard for me to even look at Russian literature because what we don't realize is that there was always a, a, a lot of animus toward, obviously toward Jews, but you know, toward Ukrainians in a big way too. For example, Joseph Brodsky, uh, a poet I dearly love, a, a Russian Jewish poet has written some horrifying stuff about Ukraine that has blown my mind. We kind of just glossed over it. Uh, Pushkin's work, Pushkin being the main Russian poet, um, it's a very imperial kind of writing a lot of the times about conquering other nations. It's, it's always been in the blood, even in the so-called high culture that Russians respect and claim to be the high point of our, of our existence, which maybe it is. But all this stuff is now being re-examined as, you know, because what's happening now, you know, thousands, maybe tens of thousands of people dying, uh, maybe more by the end of this, uh, as people who are from that part of the world, even as people who are ourselves oppressed, obviously being Jewish, um, these are all subjects we're going to be re-examining. Uh, the Penn World Festival starts tomorrow in, uh, in New York City, and uh, I'm uh, interviewing a friend of mine who's the keynote speaker, Andrei Kurkov, who is uh, a Ukrainian who was also born in Leningrad, weirdly enough, like myself, but moved to Ukraine uh, and now considers himself a Ukrainian, even though he writes in Russian. So it's like an endless matzo ball of, you know, of uh, 
it, both intermingling and, and strife. And um, I think also this is something I'm gonna write about for sure. So one of the great question, as authors who describe the deluge of often intrusive and ill-conceived controlling technology by embracing nature, do you see a massive backlash happening? Like the pro-nature backlash? I mean, uh, that's a great question. And like, are we gonna start seeing the nature books in, a, in addition to the technology, you know, the technological fiction? Mm. Claire. Claire, what do you think? Is that an ant? So wait, pro nature, you, an anti nature backlash? Is, or no, a pro. I think an anti tech backlash towards nature. Oh, I think we're already seeing that. I mean, a book that hugely got me through parts of the pandemic was, um, I mean, it's not specifically about tech, but Ross Gay's Book of Delights, which uh, Ross Gay is a wonderful poet in Indiana, and he wrote these little essaylets about going out for a walk um, yes. every day of of the year, I think it was pre-pandemic, but it came out at a great time, you know, and, and his experience of nature. Um, there's also that book, World of Wonders. Um, you know, so we're already seeing, I think, a lot of interest in these kind of uh, deep dives in nature. Um, but yeah, I mean, I hope that, I hope that it increases only. I mean, all we, what we need is to be paying more attention to nature and seeing what nature can, you know, how we need to help nature. We need to kind of get, intervene and realize that we need to start helping and supporting nature and that is you know integral to our lives so that would be wonderful yeah, I hope and the backlash happens and it's yeah, I, hope that backlash happens. I mean I see it happening and one of the things that super sad got wrong was the complete destruction of the book the book is actually making comeback not just you know in, in, in its digital form or audio form but actual printed books are still quite uh, beloved by even younger people. You know, I, my son reads books, uh, physical books, and he loves them. Um, LPs are coming back. People are sick of downloads. Um, I have a sad middle-aged hobby that is a kind of response to all this, which I collect analog watches, you know, watches without any electronic circuits from 50, 60 years ago. I find them absolutely fascinating. You take them apart, you look at the way they work. It's, you know, there's there's a real fascination with, uh, you know, and I do spend half the year upstate and that's really what upstate is all about. It's just this endless um, uh, connection with nature or mechanical objects instead of digital objects. And this is sort of on the same lines, um, someone saying, I read so much about technology rewiring our neural pathways. Um, I already have no idea what this is about, but even when we're able to disconnect, it seems like it takes a while for our brains to catch up and reset. Uh, how do we sort of like break away from this stress fear memory pathway and be more present and less mediated? I don't know if you guys have solved this qu mm -hmm. question or if you have answers, but you know, what, what in your own experience, how do you disconnect? S help us. I have not solved this question, but I do think um, speaking of, you know, hardcover, like paper books, that is one way. Like I find if I'm reading books, for me reading books on my iPad is just like a recipe for straying over towards social media. You know, if I don't want to, because my neural pathway, you know, is um, programmed that I'm gonna get ding, 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 like I'm gonna get a dopamine hit if I can leave my book and go look at social media for a second. So I, I read really primarily um, physical copy books. I try to, I go to the beach a lot, I live in LA. So um, for some reason the beach for me, becomes a no internet zone. I don't know why they're, you know, you can access the internet from the beach, but I've managed to make them completely separate in my mind. So just it's like the sand, them. right? The yeah. sand is the you problem. The sand and your device and like, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, but yeah, I think just finding ways to do that. And it's definitely true. I think also it's just accepting and it's definitely true that our neural pathways are being rewritten. So we want, we do want to try to um, contest that as much as possible, I think, um, because, you know, there are people who say, well, all technology rewrites neural pathways, but I think it's been proven now that these technologies are rewriting our neural pathways in new, faster, more extreme ways. So we do want to be kind of finding ways to separate. But I don't know. I would love to hear it, Gary. Well, I think, I think the beach is, is great. I mean, I, I, I swim about an hour a day. Uh, there's no way to do the internet. Swimming, yes. Before, I also swim. You know? I'm so glad they haven't solved that issue that, you know, you can do internet in the water. Um, you know, it's, it's these dopamine hits from, oh, somebody liked me, Ooh, you know. Yeah. Ah, it's so sad, it's uh, it reducing us to, you know, third grade, but it's like, ooh, somebody, somebody passed me a note in class, whatever, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a little sad. Um, I find walking, I also walk about six, six miles a day and there, I mean, I guess you could do this, but it actually hurts my back to walk and do this. Um, so I do it a lot less. Um, 
but it's interesting, right? I started listening to podcasts and podcasts are supposed to be this cool, you know, ooh, NPR, I can listen to NPR all day. Uh, but I find, especially in New York, that I'm missing out on all these great conversations that are happening around me. So even that cuts into my skills as an author because my favorite thing to do is walk around and just rip off people's conversations. Nothing's better than that, you know. Bad writers borrow, good writers steal, as they say. Uh, and so even the podcast, the seemingly innocuous thing, is actually blocking me off from the world, making me more atomized. So lately, I've been just taking those things out. And uh, I'm sorry, you know, Michael Barbaro or whoever, you know, I'm the, the daily. But um, but I am again experiencing the world in all its pleasure. I did the same thing when I'm abroad. You know, in Mexico City, I didn't wear them at all. And uh, you really get a whole different view of the world. You hear a whole different view of the world without those things in your ears. So. Any little thing you can do to integrate yourself with the physical world is a wonderful thing. But you're still going to follow Claire after this on yeah. Instagram, right? Yeah. Are you following me? <laughs> Claire, yeah, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> well, this leaves us uh, a lot to think about. I'm pretty hopeful. I want to take, I'm going to disconnect, take those, those ear pods out, um, um, turn those phones off. I guess go to the beach, go underwater, go places you physically can't use your phone, which are like, those are very concrete um, tips. Claire and Gary, thank you so much for, for being with us tonight. And thank you so much to everyone for joining us for this season of Unpacking the Book. This is our last event. We look forward to seeing you again next year, hopefully in person. Uh, but in the meantime, please look out for a follow-up email from the Jewish Book Council and the Jewish Museum about additional upcoming events and programs. Thank you both so much. This is a delightful event. Thank you.